PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder, which is actually a normal reaction to an abnormal amount of stress. And did you want me to talk about the, that whole thing of this, how it works, what, what it is? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Let's... Take PTSD apart. The disorder actually comes from when there is an abnormal amount of stress, the reaction in the body, in the mind and the body, is it's actually a physical reaction. And that reaction is like when you're suddenly surprised. Normally, we're surprised and then things go back to normal. When you have severe trauma, that trauma is trapped. And it's like a switch that it should be flicked off and on so many times in a lifetime, and it's just overused and, and in essence something breaks mm -hmm. and it changes the way that we react to stress actually forever. My son uh, is a sergeant in the 10th Mountain Division and he had been uh, in Afghanistan his second uh, time over. Uh, I hadn't heard from, from him very much at all and um, one day he called me from the, from the Pakistan border where he was at and we were talking and I could kind of sense that there was something really going on for him and, and uh, he started explaining to me that he had some real concerns about coming home and being able to connect with his children and his wife and um, he just declared to me that he was going to need some very serious counseling when he came home and um, it was just really alarming as a parent to hear this from your son and um, I, it was really emotional. The statistics from the military's own research says that upwards of 17% of our guys coming back from Iraq are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. But upwards of 60% of the people who are really needing the help the most won't seek help. You know, we've all, in the military, we've lived in an, uh, a code of you know, an army of one, the few, the proud, the Marines, adapt, overcome, improvise. It's, there's nothing in there that says seek help. Because the trauma comes from such intense things, a body exploding, the smell of blood, having to pick up body parts, or you're dealing with feelings of extreme grief because you've lost, like your own arm when you lose a partner in war. So there's the grief. There are all those normal feelings connected with grief, but you still must continue. And so there's this combination of feelings that are trapped and they stay there. The things that bring them back could be something as simple as the sight of blood or the sound that you heard at the same time. But once you're back, you're there. You're at your place of trauma. And for many, like myself, I go back to the original trauma and I relive it as if it's happening. It's hard to tell where you are versus where you are in your head because it's real. All I know about my father's experience was that he was in the Marine Corps and he was in Korea. And uh, he went to go seek help initially, but the therapists seemed like they were more concerned about things that were important to them and they didn't, re they didn't really relate to him. So he immediately shut down and just never went back. And consequently, what, what I was raised around was uh, a guy that I knew he loved me, but he was very volatile, very scary. The circumstances in which my son came home was an emergency leave situation, so literally within, you know, 72 hours of leaving Afghanistan, he was back at his house and he called me and he said, you know, just a few days ago I was in Afghanistan and, you know, in a really high st stress environment and now I'm cooking eggs for my kids. And uh, it was interesting to hear him say that I haven't been touched by another person in nine months. I have been with my buddies and we've been in really extreme situations and to come home, you know, if it's funny, he says, my, my wife's like a spider monkey, you know, she just wants to be with me and all around me. And, and, uh, and I get, uh, I get to the point where I, I just have, I can't, I can't, I can't handle it. And then she misunderstands. And so it's been a real adjustment trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to, how to come back, how to, how to rejoin my family is what he was telling me. It, it's weird for me because I can be 
a civilian, but I'm a soldier and I understand both sides and I have PTSD. I understand the feeling, that moment when you lose control. And many people ask me about soldiers who commit crimes who are stuck in that, that criminal act. And in reality, it's that adrenaline rush. And it's no different than the athlete who does an exceptional job. You know, the Michael Jordan who makes the perfect shot, that feeling of the whoosh. It's perfection. And the same thing happens in battle and a perfect kill. I mean, it's sad to say, but that same human emotion is there and exhilaration and job well done. And for some, those who, who may have other issues, that moment gives them the biggest feeling of personal value as well as the physical response, you know, there's, it, it's pleasurable. And it's, in society, this is wrong. But as warriors, this is right. And it's a difficult world to live in when you are a trained killer and good at it. To come back to where you can even strike another person without going to jail. As someone who has PTSD, I had to look in my daughter's eyes and see fear because I was in rage in the midst of an episode. And a child knows a difference. What can you trust? And so many children from this war will not have parents again. They'll come back, but they'll be shells of who they were. It was 5 a.m. as far as I remember in um, January 17th, 1991, when the siren started running and everybody was really in a horror. And then you, all what you can hear is bombing, one after the other, one after the other. The power went out and um, you start keep on hearing the bombing and you can feel the, the deep fear and the deep in your heart. It continued for 42 days. During this 42 days, there was a heavy, heavy bombing on Iraq. All the infrastructure is almost destroyed. So when I say no power, I mean no traffic light, so more car accidents, more victims. No power means no hospitals, special, so a few hospitals, only the main medical centers in, in Baghdad have a backup a generator to work. And no power means um, no factories, people won't go to work anymore, means increased unemployment rate, means no income, more poverty, more malnutrition. One of the uh, victims uh, was really a very, very uh, hard case for me. Uh, he was like 10 or 11 years old and uh, he was an orphan when I talked to his mom and I knew his history. Like, um, he left school to su support his family, so he was in his way to sell some cigarettes nearby the pavement where the car bomb happened. And uh, this little child got a broken hands and broken legs in a way that they, the doctors told me that he may g got, uh, he, they may have to amputate one of his legs. And I can imagine like uh, a 10 years old boy, what does it mean for him? to live with one limb. They have been punished for nothing. Those are innocent civilians. They were just hoping to live like any other human on earth. And uh, this kid, for example, if he didn't get enough help, if he didn't get a prosthetic limb to help him to get a job, if he didn't get enough education, all what he have in his heart, a dream that will never come true, a hope that will never find a space to grow and uh, a hostility that will never end. Because I know, I mean, I was trying my best to let everybody know that American people are very good people and they 
can help. But the problem is that we need to prove. We all get up in the morning and we listen to the radio first thing in the morning. You walk down and you get in at the breakfast table with the newspaper and you read another story about a car bombing in Baghdad or about the assault on an insurgent stronghold near Basra or you read about civilian deaths in, in uh, Fallujah and uh, we're confronted with a world that is broken and the question for each of us individually has to be what can I personally do, I must do, to help to heal this world. We don't always recognize the power of our actions and we think that history either sort of instantly changes with these grand democratic acts or else, um, or else we're powerless to, to shift it. And if you look at the stories of how people actually change history time and time again, um, it's often the unheralded actions, the small actions that end up um, changing things. Today, I work with soldiers. I work with returning soldiers. I work with families in trauma. The thing I concentrate on most is helping other soldiers understand what's wrong with them and learning to live and learn and love despite that. When I talk to people about uh, veterans and families, our, our organization and what we're trying to do to build a community support network of family members, employers, community leaders, um, the overwhelming response that I get, which is really refreshing, is people, people generally say something to the effect of, let's get it right this time. You know, let's, let's learn from the past. Social change isn't accomplished by simply voting for a different politician or by voting on a budget. Social change occurs in the hearts of human beings. I guess I would say, um, is that Danny, this is a, this is a long-term process and it's going to take time. And, and we're going to make a difference for all of your, your buddies that are coming back as well that maybe aren't seeking help as you are. And, um, and we're going to make a difference in the community because of that. Well, I mean, conflict has certainly been with us since we've been on the planet, but war in terms of organized, mechanized, bureaucratized uh, massacre of other human beings, I mean, that's, that's a creature of our times, our culture, our economy, our political systems. And I think it's possible to change. Is it easy? No, but um, sometimes the, um, uh, the, the title of my last book came from a Billie Holiday song, which the phrase was, the difficult we'll do right now, the impossible will take a little while. And maybe that's in the vein of the kinds of things that will take a little while, but I don't think it's impossible. The healing process isn't something someone does to us or for us. It's something we do. And I feel like my calling now is to, is to reach as far as I can to make sure those steps are sure and solid. And I'll do it till I die. The wounds of having seen people killed in front of your eyes, the, the loss of limbs in front of your eyes, the, the bleeding, the, the grief, the loss of comrades, all of this has an enormous impact on the soul. And we need to do a lot better for these young veterans, for these young people who have given their all for our nation. And it is my prayer and my hope that we'll do that in, a, in an effective way in an unprecedented way because this is a bit of an unprecedented experience in the last couple of decades.